I know that the thing that I do, God has not privileged me to do it because somebody else cannot do it. God has not privileged me to do it because he cannot do it himself. God has privileged me to do it because God wants to give me an opportunity to participate in his divine agenda and processes. You see, it's an overbloated sense of self-worth that has come upon a generation that has made it look like it is impossible for God to do with us what he did with our fathers. All you need to do is read the books of men that lived before us. One of the books of such men that literally damaged my work with God, and I mean that in a positive sense, is A.W. Tozer. And once you read some of these men, you will find out that a healthy sense of the realization that God can do without me is part of the reason that they had such rich encounters with God. And since this is a minister's conference, I need to remind you, you are not in that important. As great as it is that God will have to limit himself in such a way that a partnership between the divine and the human has to exist on the face of the earth for his agenda to find expression, that arrangement is not something that God cannot do without. If the need so arises that God needs to do without it, he will. And you have seen cases whereby he had to open the mouth of a donkey to speak. To let you know that if he is so pressed, even inanimate objects can become portals of his grace. Because after all, everything, the Bible says that even the trees, as they move around in the wind, what you call the bending of the wind is them waving their hands in worship. They are giving God praise consistently. So one thing that will help you on your journey of your service delivery in ministry is to understand that if God privileges you, like Apostle TJ was saying on Thursday, if God privileges you and calls you into the ministry, you need to realize that that calling is not because you are very important. It's because God has given you a privilege of partnership. And you see, somehow, if you notice the way our meetings have been going since Wednesday, you will find out that the person who leads the charge will tie into the person who comes to teach, and the thing will just flow. Pastor Oji has made my work very, very easy. Very easy. Very easy. Because the thing that led me to the place of worship in my contemplation since the early hours of the morning is that I was asking the Lord, what does it mean to be your servant? <laughs> because you see, if you study the Bible, one of the highest titles that, were given, that was given to men, most of the great men you know in scriptures were called the servant of God. Moses, the servant of God. David, the servant of God. Isaiah, the servant of God. All you need to do is do Bible study. So on my bed, I was asking the Lord, what does it mean to be your servant? Such privileged title that God gave to men, how do we interpret it in present day and what does it actually mean when it comes out of the mouth of God? Very important. And the scripture the Lord gave me to begin to lead us as we try to dive this morning into the things that are available is Psalm 89 and verse 20. Psalm 89 and verse 20. Psalm 89 and verse 20. I have found who? David. So, we will now need to understand what it means when he says, my servant, David. How do you measure a servant? 
Now, Pastor Oji was just trying to express to us the importance of service in the life of a minister. And you see, remember, the context in which we use the word minister in this minister's conference is not restricted to the fivefold. Are you with me? So we're not just talking about apostles, we're not talking, talking, talking about prophets alone, evangelists, pastor, teachers. We're talking about everyone who, by the grace of God, exists in the space of Christian endeavor, laboring to ensure that the plans and the purposes of God find expression on the earth. So you can be a minister in a denomination. You can be a minister in the secular world. As long as you have consecrated your enterprise and your activity, even though it is secular, to the delivery of God's purposes and counsel. In fact, every one of us, once we get born again, you have been called into ministry. Every one of us. Every one of us. So when we say that someone is the servant of God, because you see, this Psalm 89 is a very special psalm because this is not a psalm of David. In fact, let's begin from verse 19. Let me show you something. This is not a psalm of David. This is a, a masquil. I don't have the time. but A masquil is like a, a teaching. In fact, Bible scholars tell us that there are psalms that are didactic. And didactic psalms are psalms that are written to provide teaching, structured teaching that reveal certain truths. So this is one of those psalms that you will consider a didactic psalm. It's a teaching. And the one who wrote this psalm, is not a psalm of David, it's a psalm of a singer called Ivan, one of the singers of Asaph. So he was inspired by God to reveal the things that he was revealing. So he says now in this psalm, he says, then you, notice the you there is in what? Speaking about who? The Lord. Then you spoke in a vision to your Holy One and said, I have given help to one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from the people. If you read this, you, will, you will, might be tempted to interpret this as a reference to the Messiah. Right? But you need to know the context in which this is written. And to aid your understanding, let's use it, another translation. Give me NLT. Long ago, you spoke in a vision to who? Who are your faithful people? Israel. Are you with me? And he says... You said, I have raised up who? A warrior. I have selected him from the common people to be what? King. So Ethan here is recounting how David came into such position of authority and power in Israel. So that whoever reads will no longer be confused. He now says in verse 20, the warrior whom I have selected from amongst my people and I made king, his name is what? David. David. Now the thing about this is, remember that this is a vision from the Lord. The Lord was the one speaking to Ethan and Ethan was communicating the vision of the Lord. So what did the Lord say to Ethan? I have found who? David my son. So it is the Lord that was calling David his servant. Are you still here? And as Pastor Oji was talking about those of us in ministry and saying that a critical aspect of ministry that has been lost on a generation is the aspect of service. And you know, he was trying to explain to us that metaphor of pouring water on the hands of Elijah. Do you know I was reading a Bible scholar and he was giving us references to that metaphor in ancient Israel. It was not only demeaning to be called somebody who poured water on the hands of the prophet because you cleaned his hands when he ate. It's because even when he went to toilet eh, and used his hands on his buttocks, 
you were the one that came to what? Worship. It was such a degrading title. Is it not funny that on the day that God will manifest Elisha to kings, the reference for him, the recommendation for him is the degrading act. Oh, sir. So if man knows how to define service, then we must also ask God, what does it mean to be your servant? So Paul gives us an idea in describing David. Give me Acts 13. Give me 22. Acts 13, give me 22. Just stay with me. What God said I should do this morning is impartation. But let's see. But God removed Saul and replaced him with David, a man about whom God said, I have found David, son of Jesse. Remember who is speaking here? Paul, the apostle Paul. A man after my own heart, he will what? So the first sign of servanthood in the eyes of God, the way God defines is his servant, is one who does everything he wants him to do. Are you with me? So it means, therefore, that every servant, your entry point into servanthood will be a block of instructions. The minute God recruits you as his servant, oh, help me, Holy Spirit. The minute the Lord calls you to that privileged position of his servant, the first thing you will receive from the Lord is a block of what? Instructions. In fact, the posture of servanthood that is mirrored in scriptures is such that if you look at that word carefully, carefully and you do the etymology, Servants are like waiters. Come, man of God. Stand. Now, when you get born again and you are brought into the environment of the government and the rulership and the reign of Jesus Christ, you appear in the Lord's presence as his servant. Your posture is supposed to be one of waiting. As you come before him, he, in his mercy, will now begin to issue you instructions for your life and destiny. Those bundle of instructions, we have defined them in many ways in Christianity. One is dedication. Two is sanctification. Three is consecration. And you see, these three things do not mean the same. When he brings you into the environment of the rulership and the reign of Jesus Christ, he expects you to dedicate yourself to him. It's part of the protocols of servanthood. Because without dedication, without sanctification, without consecration, you can't be his servant. You will not do everything that he wants you to. And you see, in the body of Christ, we use these three words interchangeably, but they do not mean the same thing. To dedicate means to give up to. Okay. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of what? All he has done for you. The word there, to give your bodies to God, is dedication. You, by an act of your will, you decide to dedicate, give up to. I heard a preacher say that... Uh, 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 when, when, when we evangelists are on the field, we will be telling people, come and give your life to Christ. 
that you don't give your life to Christ. You come to salvation to take the life of Christ. Semantics. As beautiful as it sounds, when you take the life of Christ, you are expected to give your life to him. That's dedication. What is the essence of dedication? Because of all he has done for you, you, as an act of your appreciation, you decide to become his bond servant. You give him your bodies. And the reason Paul uses the word bodies there, he's talking about the total man. All that relates to you, you dedicate it to God. In your dedication, you stand at attention under God, waiting for what he wants to do next with your life. I need to ask you, oh minister of God today, the things you are doing with your life, who gave you the instructions? What you are becoming now, the, the, the standards you have set for yourself. You know, Bolade, this generation, you know, when they are crying, oh God! Use me. You know what they mean by use me? Make me famous. They have a semblance, an example, a portrait of what they think is a successful ministry. So when they are crying to God, use me, they are saying, make me more famous than this man who is my mentor. They think to be used by God is synonymous to be popular before men. They think that to be used by God is synonymous with becoming famous and a celebrity. 